Hi, good morning, everyone. We'd like to thank you all for coming today. Um, and we'd also like to thank Mr. Villa, if y'all can give him a round of applause for coming out today. Oops, my computer's acting up. Um, so this is just our spiel that we are JMPLS and we would like to just let y'all know that the purpose of our society is to just promote the understanding of the legal profession, the law and government operation and to assist its members in the processes of entering the legal profession which is through this event that we have today. And today we have Mr. Mario Villa, who is the Director of Student Recruitment and Financial Aid visiting us today. And he'll be answering questions and just talking about what student life is like at UT Law and to just cover any questions that you might guys have. So we invite Mr. Villa to come out today. Thank you. And I'm gonna have Sabrina actually uh do my PowerPoint because I didn't realize, I didn't know if there was a clicker or not, and I like to kind of interact with y'all out here. So uh, just like she mentioned, I'm Mario Villa. I'm originally from Fort Worth, so I'm from North Texas. Uh, I was, that's where I came from this morning. I just kind of drove over from kind of like a little bit south of TCU is where my family's house is. So it was fun to kind of come up here and just spend time with them. And um, I'm actually a PhD student. Um, I'm about to go through my proposal and I'm studying uh, law student life, but particularly the financial wellness, financial well-being, and kind of how that uh, implements within student well-being. And so that's kind of what my own personal research is, is focused on. But I've been at Texas Law since 2013. Um, I love it. Before then, I used to be an undergrad admissions guy and go to all the high schools, and I, I've been through most regional high schools in the area, as well as like in different parts of Texas. So um, speaking about UT was not the, learning curve for me, but it was more the financial aid side. And so I know a lot of students have those types of concerns also at law school, because you know it's not, an ex it's not a cheap endeavor, it is an investment. So we'll be happy to talk about those types of things. Um, so the first thing I wanted to kind of talk about, if you want to click for me, is just some uh, you know, Texas residents. Some people forget, just because of you know, who our competitors are nationwide, that we are a state school, and that's a great thing because we are required to make sure that we are here primarily for Texas residents. We still get state subsidies, which, you know, designates us as a public institution and a public law school. So we have pretty much over 120 schools represented in our class, which, as you can see, I mean, these are just some of the Texas institutions that uh, make up our community. So I know we were just talking earlier about some of the UTD students that I've gotten to know as they've come from uh, Dr. Kirby's office to our law school and just how they're making a great impact at the, at the institution. And so be aware that, um, you know, m majority of the spots that we have at Texas Law are for Texas residents. And um, this past year we had about Gosh, I mean, we've had the most amount of applications ever in our history. I think it was close to 8,000, which there's a lot of reading, um, <laughs> a lot of personal statements, a lot of recommendation letters, as you can imagine. Um, our class is about 419, 420, starting, um, well, about 419 right now in the fall in the 1L class. But um, yeah, you can see we've enrolled over 1,300 alums from this, these colleges, and we continue to um, reach out to every Texas institution, including UTD, and like I said, I'm, I'm always happy to come up here and work with your, your organization and with Dr. Kirby on, on anything y'all have that we can kind of participate in uh, for, you know, within y'all's organization and within the pre-law advising. So if you want to go to the next slide. So these are some quick facts about the class. I already mentioned the, um, the size of it, but you can see the median LSAT and GPA, or 169, 3.8. Um, this was the first year, and I think since I've been at the law school, that we actually had more women than men enroll this fall, um, which is great because women are an underrepresented group in the legal profession. So we're at 57% women in this first year class, 30% uh, minorities, 35 states represented. I mentioned about 120, but because we had such a larger class, now we have about 166 schools represented. 11% um, of the class have grad degrees, which means they may have gone to a graduate school or did a joint degree, like a two plus three program with an institution where they already come, are coming in with a master's. 6% uh, are about 30 or over. Um, because we are a state school, like I said, we have to have at least 65% Texas residents or more, and so that leaves about 35% to be non-Texas residents. Then the average age is, is 24. 
which is not on here, but 10% uh, are labeled as first generation, which with us, that means um, neither parent has gone to college. Um, some law schools may think of first gen as neither um, parent went to law school and they're the first lawyer, but um, I think this re number represents the uh, uh, matriculation to higher ed in general. If you wanna move the next slide for me. We just had our bar passage rates results uh, announced and we were at 94% in 2021. Um, and that just came out um, with the State Bar of Texas. So we are the top law school in the state that has the top bar passage rate. Um, but this was 2020, 2020's numbers the year before is 91%. And you can see 100% at the New York bar. A great thing about Texas law is that we are a coast to coast law school, which means that a lot of students will um, take the New York bar or the California bar and do excellent. Um, we're also a UBE state, which means you could take the UBE exam and actually have the, that licensure um, uh, extended to, I can't remember how many states, is it 30? 35. So 35 states. So Texas is a part of that now, um, of that system. So you know, a lot of students will still sit for the UBE exam and you're able to, to transfer that license to a different state without having to retake another bar, which is you know, a really good thing to kind of open up access to the legal profession and other markets without having to sit through another uh, st strenuous law exam. So next slide. Um, I always talk about this because again, I'm the money guy at Texas Law, but we are a great return on investment. You can see these are our schools that tend to rank around us in um, the US News World Report. Um, you can see other public schools that are high up there as well as privates. Uh, it's is a great, great um, bang for your buck when you think about the amount of money you would spend um, with the quality of education. Um, you can see people that are in that same kind of quality ranking will be about two times as much in just tuition and fees, and that's not counting living expenses. So if you can imagine going to a, a school like Columbia or Berkeley, um, you, you know, San Francisco cost of living, New York cost of living. Um, ours is about 21,000 in Austin for nine months. I'm sure theirs is quite, quite much more. So if y'all are uh, debt adverse or cost sensitive in this process, um, you know, I think we are a great, uh, great plus in that, in that attribute. And so definitely keep us in mind for that. I would say right now, 91% come in with some sort of scholarship or grant. And we can talk about that um, when we get to that section of the presentation. But, you know, it does make for a really great bargain. Um, is anyone not from Texas? Like, is it considered an out-of-state resident? Anyone? Okay, I'm just checking. Um, all right, next slide. Uh, we also have an amazing career statistics. Uh, these are the recent, most recent numbers. It, this will probably update by sometime in the spring, because what happens is the students are required to report about 10 months out um, where they're located in employment, and those go into these uh, ABA career uh, report. So these are just the current stats that you can see here. 89% had a full-time bar passage rate. Uh, the average starting salary is a little under 160,000. And about a quarter of our graduates start their law, legal careers outside of Texas. So again, most likely in the California markets, we have a great pipeline to the LA area and the Bay area. Uh, we also have a sh really strong pipeline to the New York legal market in New York City, and then DC, obviously because of the a uh, connection between Austin and Washington, um, both on a uh, private sector, but also just like government and uh, public interest-based careers, government jobs, federal jobs. Um, you know, Austin is a big state capital, it represents a lot of people in the US, so there's quite a bit of uh, Austin to Washington-based things that our students can really get involved in. Um, the way our career services works, um, you're actually assigned a counselor based by the, the area of the law that you're interested in. So we don't just assign you someone random by name, like last name assignment. Um, you won't start working with them until October 15th, but you do have serious checkpoints with them. Um, and what I mean by that is they require you to come in and meet with them uh, at least every six months to kind of keep track of where you are, keep track of what internships you're um, doing. Uh, and you know, we get ranked by employment, right? So we definitely put a lot of money and investment into preparing you for interviews, etiquette, kind of the legal profession, you know, tenants that you're expected to kind of abide by in, in the offices in terms of just like decor and some of the things you may have, you may have learned if y'all have had legal internships already. Um, but that's what our office is trained to do and to help y'all um, get ready for that process. All right, next slide. 
So a lot of people always ask me, um, I think I may take my mask off because it's like really kind of itching <laughs> and I'm talking and it's not really big. Um, this will probably help me communicate a lot better. But um, there's four main things I always talk about of what makes Texas law stand out. People always ask me in presentations, you know, what, what is it that makes Texas law unique? And I would say these are the kind of the four main attributes. So prestigious faculty, I would say, is really up there. Um, a lot of our faculty have podcasts, they blog, they tweet, they produce content for a lot of different national media on a lot of different subjects. Uh, the most popular, I would say, by now is Steve Vladek and Bobby Chesney. They're excellent national uh, security experts, cybersecurity experts are always on CNN. I think they've, they, CNN has a depot office in Austin that they could film from, like if they are asked to do, to give kind of their um, experience, you know, they just go there and talk and they're put on broadcast with all the other news shows. Um, we have Sandy Levinson, with constitutional law, and any kind of like issue that may be originating from the Fifth Circuit, there's usually uh, some of our professors that are asked to give their own opinions as it's reported in the news. So our faculty write textbooks for other uh, legal subjects. They're kind of, uh, a lot of them are in the premier uh, place within their uh, field, and so um, I love it on the tour, there's a section of the law school that shows what they call faculty writings, and every faculty member gets to pick like one to two books and it's in this kind of lit case, kind of like a museum exhibit, and so you can kind of look at each name by alphabet and kind of see the, the book that they've written or the uh, journal that they've been published in. But I definitely encourage you to explore our faculty section of our website, because you could see pretty much um, their resumes as well as uh, what they've been writing and some of their publications, but they're a really great resource. And only the best faculty teach our first year students. So when our dean came in, Gosh, it's been a long time since he's been here, but he um, pretty much took out the faculty and the 1L curriculum that were not great at teaching. Like they were probably on the lower end of the eva student evaluations and only placed the tenured faculty who um, have great feedback on teaching, great methodologies in teaching law. And you know they're the, the premier uh, lecturers and teachers in our 1L classes, in our doctrinal classes. So I've seen several students come in over the years that are like, oh, I'm gonna be you know, a litigator or I wanna do immigration law, but they take property or something kind of completely off, the, off the, uh, that sphere of the law and they're just like mind blown and they're like, I think I may wanna do something within torts or within you know, civil procedure and I never thought I would like that, but I had a, you know, a, that professor really just like um, evoked and kind of like, uh, found a passion in myself. And so that tends to happen quite a bit, even in that first year. Alumni mentoring, we probably have, gosh, it's been at least six years, or if not five years or so, of an alumni mentoring director. So we're a really big relationship-oriented school, uh, and I think anyone that you may know that has attended Texas Law could tell you that. We're not a school that you can kind of uh, blend in like a wallflower. We're definitely, you know, we definitely check on our students. And part of that is um, alumni mentoring. We actually have a full-time director of alumni mentoring whose sole purpose is to match you with one of 25,000 alums that are throughout uh, Texas and throughout the world. So your first year, you can go through this really fun kind of OkCupid, okay you know, match.com profile thing, and you fill out a survey about yourself. and. You know, she goes in and she actually like matches you to alums in Austin, and that way you can just meet them in person and have lunch and just you know be able to have that person in uh, that's there that's accessible in the city. But you can go through the same process as a second or third year based by practice area or geogra geographic market that you're targeting. And so um, I think one of the best things about our school is because before the recession, we used to be about 500 people per class. We have so many more alums that are out there practicing and a lot of them have a big affinity towards Texas law, so they are happy to help. Um, we always do receptions over the summers in our major markets, so like if you're interning in New York or in DC or LA, um, we actually put on uh, receptions where we actually bring, bring all of the practicing attorneys, the student attorneys that are interning, people who are admitted from those areas will also be there, so it's more of a just showcasing you know, the connection that we, we are cultivating and building. But um, the society program is also the pinnacle of like our student culture. Um, as a first year student, you're sorted into one of eight societies. They're kind of like Harry Potter houses for law school, but they're not, 
There's no like house per se, like physical structure, um, but you're led by two to three upperclassmen mentors called Dean's Fellows, and the societies are about 35 to 40 people large. You take all your first year classes throughout the entire year with that cohort, so it really makes the experience not scary, because law school definitely has this cutthroat competitive kind of stereotype. If any of y'all seen like Paper Chase or some of these older movies set in law school, you know, even Legally Blonde, I mean, it's there's just not comfortable places like law school lectures um, because you could be cold called or you're expected to kind of have read everything and you don't know who the professor may be targeting for that day. Sometimes they'll let you know up in advance. Like our professors always tell our students in advance like, Hey, you're, science, you're you know, expected to answer the questions in the class today, because um, that is the Socratic method. But societies make it way less nerve-wracking. Uh, say if you get sick, uh, more than likely, someone in your society will have taken notes for you, check up on you. Um, you know, we definitely, our, our dean's fellows are kind of like resident assistants or like teaching assistants, or kind of both combined. They'll put on seminars on outlining and. Um, they'll, you'll do community service as a group together. Uh, we have this really fun kind of week-long society week. It's kind of like homecoming week in high school because it's every day there's like a competition, but it's like brains and brawn. So, you know, and there's trivia nights and penny wars and wear your t-shirt, society t-shirt day and get counted. But at the end, it culminates into like a field day at, at our intramural fields. And so um, that's, that picture is the Hodges Society who won that particular year the Society Cup. So we do have like this society trophy that is a big deal that kind of gets passed from society to society. But once you're sorted in a part of that society, you're a part of that group for the full three years at Texas Law, and some of the students will run or like try to try out for, to be the leaders for the next group of one else coming in. So it is a paid position, and it's like, again, a big part of our student culture. Um, it's really kind of cut down on any kind of like cutthroat competitive, you know, um, aura that you may feel when you step into a law school. It's definitely, definitely not like that. And I think, I think the society program has been around since like 04 or so. So, oh, experiential learning. If I, sorry to go back one. I forgot to talk about that. We're a law school that actually started with a lot of experiential learning clinics before a lot of law schools were required to have those options under ABA rules. So we actually have uh, 15 clinics that are listed in that book that you've taken. Most of them are in the family law and civil law based areas, criminal law areas. We do have one within entrepreneurship and community development. Um, a unique thing is that we actually have two within capital punishment. We have an actual innocence clinic and a capital punishment clinic. Uh, we also have about one to two within immigration. We have immigration and then transnational workers' rights. Um, so again, some of our kind of like premier areas and premier things within tech Texas, like immigration and capital punishment, we definitely have a lot of clinics that uh, students can take part in. Um, we also have a, a brand new law and religion clinic. Um, so if you're not aware, we opened the Beck Laughlin First Amendment Center, which definitely focuses on First Amendment issues. So it's a very constitutional law-based clinic. We also have a Supreme Court clinic, which is that picture above. We actually have attorneys who um, you know, put together Supreme Court arguments, and our students get to work with them throughout a whole semester and go back and forth between DC and Austin. So it's an awesome experience. Um, but we, again, I think shine within experiential learning. We have an amazing pro bono program. When you really think about the law, um, lawyers serve, right? They, there's this kind of altruism of being a leader in your community and helping people that are in need. And we definitely kind of try to push that philosophy onto the student culture. So um, I would say close to 90% of the students will, I think, volunteer at least 50 hours or more um, of just pro bono work. So we do everything from expunction of records, transgender citizens' rights, uh, working with veterans, working with people who are incarcerated, both children and adults, people who are in hospice care to kind of get their, like, you know, wills and estates issues, um, especially if they can't afford an attorney. So there's a lot of ways you can make an impact as early as your 1L year and get involved in some of these projects, either creating projects on your own or joining in on a lot of projects. I think other ones I can think of off the top of my head include voting rights, educational policy-based things, like teaching, um, the law to like middle school students, things like that. So there's a lot of different kind of cool volunteer service projects that you can get involved in. And I think a big part of that is just our connection in Austin and being so close to all the state agencies and all the nonprofits that are kind of state focused that are trying to uh, um, advance a lot of causes and a lot of um, 
you know, philosophies of what they feel should be important and should be prioritized. All right. So key factors in the admissions process. If y'all are anyone applying to law school in this coming year, like you're in the middle, okay, one, two, three. So three of y'all are in this cycle now. How about any of y'all are thinking of the year in 2023 fall? Okay, a good portion. What about 2024? Maybe, which is fine. So be aware that a majority of our students actually come in within two to five years from undergrad. I would say only about a third come in direct from undergrad, but a lot of people take time, they do other things, which is perfectly fine. Um, and I can kind of talk about those in, in asking questions or getting questions from y'all. But we're gonna go through each of these um, components in detail and feel free to stop and ask questions, especially when we go through this in more detail because I'm happy to stop and answer them. I'm, I do this for a living, so feel free to use me to clarify. So the first one, if you wanna click ahead, is the uh, personal statement. This is the first thing I actually like to read in an application. Um, I don't like to be biased by numbers or anything else because this is kind of like your introduction. This, like if y'all were the admissions committee and I was talking about my life to y'all in this format right now, like with a microphone speaking, trying to kind of give you a little bit of a short synopsis of my life, that was kind of what the personal statement represents. It's kind of your introduction to us as a committee. It's a chance for us to kind of get to know two prongs of the evaluation, one of which is how well you write. People forget sometimes when they're applying to law school that words in the English language are to the law like numbers are to science and engineering and to the health professions. It's a foundational block that has to be shown at a really strong mastery level. So one of the key things that you have to understand is that the writing will be evaluated pretty heavily in how you write, how you express your thoughts, how we understand um, how you're thinking and how you kind of take us through your story. But the other part is just how we get to know you. We don't have a specific kind of template. Um, I think a big trap that students fall into is that they think that we're looking for a checklist of items and that you have to kind of meet everything in this story, but that's not really true. It's kind of a blank palette because this is a chance for you to kind of represent the best version of yourself um, in your story. Um, some people will tell it through a series of small little vignettes, you know, and it's all under a theme and it kind of all ties together. Others will pick kind of one specific incident where, you know, that really is what caused them to see law school as the next step. Um, that is the main, I would say, the main thing that you're trying to answer for us is why, why is law school the next step in this journey for you? Um, you don't need to focus on what kind of attorney do you want to be or, you know, um, I've known since I was three that I was going to be a, a, a criminal defense attorney and, you know, like you don't need to kind of go back because we, like I just mentioned, we understand that everyone can switch and it's really common that students switch uh, into other pathways of law once they start really kind of getting into, into the... Uh, trenches of it. So be aware that we would like for you to just get to know who you are, um, you know, what's, what's been profound in your life, what's really kind of stuck out to you. Please do not start with the Webster's Dictionary defines justice as, and then, you know, or a famous quote that I, you know, I mean, like those kinds of cheesy intros, you definitely have to hook us in the beginning. I mean, I think that's a big part of it because we read so many of these that uh, a good hook is a, is a crucial thing in this process. But if this is kind of new to you, um, there's a lot of different uh, resources out there. My favorite is Purdue Owl. It, they have a great list of questions for like personal statements or statement of purposes if you're applying to grad school, just to kind of get you thinking of what is it that I may want to talk about or write about. Um, obviously, I'm sure uh, Dr. Kirby's office will sit with you and look at personal statements and give you pointers or, or things, because a big part of it too, and I struggle with this as a writer, is trying to be concise and to condense everything. You only have two pages, so it's not gonna be you know, a really, really long story. And I think in a way that's even more challenging, having to be short and having to condense everything into a shorter amount of, of space. Um, questions about personal statement at all from the audience? No? Okay. Yes, Dr. Kirby. Two pages. Um, a little, I think we, we clarified, I think it's 11 to 12 point. No larger than 12. Yeah. Times New Roman, Arial, like the really common fonts. So, yes. We're very, this is not the chance, this is not the time to kind of be artsy or fun. Um, you definitely want to stick to a more kind of traditional look in, in those types of things, like margins, you know, everything like that, fonts, font size. All right, next slide. 
Resume. Um, when you apply for a regular job out there in the real world, I mean, the resume is going to be a short one pager, right? But in our process, this is not the chance to be a one page resume. We actually want up to three. And the reason for that is because a lot of um, activities that you're doing may require a lot of context. Like there may be some sort of like comment award, and I, I know that's your mascot here, but what is that? I don't know, right? You'll have to give me some additional context, contextual information to flush that out for me. Um, so there's a lot of great templates out there for resumes. Um, again, some students, they try, this is where they try to be creative and fun and you know, weird fonts and weird ways they organize. I'm more of a just give me the information. As long as it's legible and I can f find the flow, it's great. Um, most people organize it by like area, like education and community service and leadership, but then, and then they kind of go into a chronological order within each kind of category. And I think that's a really great, simple way to kind of flow it. You don't want to go any time before college. So I would say a good entry point is like the summer before your first year of college. If there was something significant, feel free to start there. And again, this is a really good chance to see a testimony, written testimony of what you've done outside of classes or outside of being a student. But that could include research papers or research projects or um, theses uh, or special classes that were pretty particular or pretty unique that you want to highlight. That's perfectly okay. But you can see behind me some of the other categories could include foreign language proficiency or um, honors or other things that you've earned and attained. But um, yes, resume is very important because again, it, it just helps to kind of contextualize your life outside of the student classroom. Question? Yeah, so is there some like, advantage to having work experience after like, graduate school? Definitely? No, um, so for us, we, we are not, so the question was, is there an advantage to you know, having work experience, um, or not having work experience like on your resume if you're applying right after? And I would say it kind of depends because we're not in danger of closing at any time. Like, if you want to work, travel, volunteer, do Teach for America, go get a Fulbright, do, you know, just kind of see things and kind of, you know, test the waters of adulting, you know, I mean, that's great. Because it's only going to add to your application and add to your experiences and kind of, like, bring that addition to the, to the class. Um, but again, like I said, if you are ready to come into law school at this point, and you know you necessarily don't have work experience, but you've done other things within your community on campus. That's perfectly fine. Um, another question I get common that's kind of similarly related is, do I have to have a legal internship? And the answer is no. Uh, again, all that does really for you is to show what that area of the law is like, what a day-to-day -day life of a professional in that area of the law does, and if it's something you may like. But we don't give points or take away points for legal internships uh, because we know those aren't like necessarily accessible um, or as open as, as people think. So, you know, I would say the, the tenet that you need to follow is that there shouldn't be a time of your life at this point where you're not doing something, right? So as long as it's like if you're working or volunteering or you're leading organizations, um, again, lawyers are leaders in their community, right? I mean, they're, they run for school boards. They, they definitely hold positions in, in government leadership. So um, that's just the privileges you're given in graduating from law school. I mean, people will expect you to kind of lead them. You may have neighbors that say, hey, I have a legal issue. Can you help me, right? I mean, you'll have people from your high school and middle school just like find you all of a sudden once they've heard you've graduated. So, you know, we want to see that you have that kind of like uh, being able to be comfortable around groups of people, you know, I mean, when you really think about the law, it is a service oriented profession. So how have you served? You know, that's maybe another way you want to think of it, whether it's people, other things, other causes. We're not expecting you to get involved in every little thing, right? Um, I've seen students that have resumes that have like really full and but they never went really past a membership level. Um, and, you know, we really are looking for those people that um, have kind of found their niche, wherever that is, whether it's off campus, on campus, uh, and other opportunities, and have really kind of made the most out of those and, and taken some leadership in that. Um, question, other questions? That's a good, that was a good question. Okay. Next. Standardized tests, our favorites. Um, the LSAT and the GRE. So the LSAT's only offered a certain amount of times per year. It's six, right? Six now? Oh gosh, it's, it's LSAC's change. I mean, <laughs> we were just talking about the LSAT and how crazy it's become, but yes, the LSAT is still kind of the the test that all law schools will take, you know. And so uh, it's offered only certain times of year. There's no math on it, which could be an advantage for you or not. Um, and again, uh, it's kind of what 
people have taken for decades to matriculate into law school. There's five sections, one of which is not used as uh, your score. It's used to kind of test new questions. Four. Four and one is. Okay, so now it's reduced to four and now one. Um, they also, I know during the pandemic, they had an online test. It's still online. It's still online the L, the, so you don't have to go to a testing site. So you can see how, how um, low my, my proficiency is on the test nowadays. That all these, we'll talk. But go see Dr. Kirby about the test and learn it. Um, but that's the big thing I tell students is understand the test, understand the tenets of it, what the types of questions are, because they honestly don't change question types or like how they write questions. It's just that the, the language and the, the subject of the question changes from test to test. But what I always try to tell students to do is just get a practice test of actual LSAT sections Go through it, don't time yourself, just make sure that you just go through it, see what you get right, see what you get wrong, and that should kind of give you a starting point of what areas of the law uh, or of the test, the test section, um, you know, you're really good at and what you may have to work on and kind of put more attention to. And um, what I like about the LSAC test guides and test prep guides they give you is they actually explain the, the answers and like why the answer is wrong and they will give you that um, piece so that in case it kind of helps your thinking and to kind of reframe your mind, um, that's a really great thing. Um, once you start getting your accuracy down, then start working on getting faster and faster. And a lot of students always tell me, they were like, I used to score in the you know, high 160s in the practice and, you know, and then they came and their actual test was like lower 160s and they're kind of like really shocked. There is a, in my opinion, and just anecdotally as, as a professional in this industry, I, I really feel that there is a like test day variable you can't accommodate for. Um, it's, you, people try to emulate it, they try to like put themselves in cold rooms or test with all their friends, like if it's the real thing, but I don't know what it is about test day that really kind of changes your, your body mechanics and your, your thinking. Um, so there is that, that, uh, that uh, principle there, in my opinion. Uh, the GRE is really unique. Um, we, we started taking it a few years ago, um, and what it's unique about it is there is math. You start the, with the writing first, and then uh, you switch back and forth between quant and qual qualitative or verbal reasoning, I should say. And again, you can take it once every 21 days. Uh, with the LSAT, you can only take it no more than like five times in a two-year period, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, the test is designed to kind of like, it's really, really an anomaly if you have like a 30 point jump unless there was something s significant that was happening to you. Um, you know, uh, usually most people kind of increase or decrease up or down by, you know, a couple of, couple of points here or there. Um, we don't average, we look at the highest. So if you do send your scores to us, um, LSAC is gonna send them all and we, um, we only look at the highest for scholarship as well as for admissions and um, prepare. Holistic review, it's not everything. Um, it is a big part of the process, but uh, we were just talking about how we have students all the time that score below the median of the LSAT that we just saw at the beginning, and they're still admissible to Texas law. So um, do the best you can, but um, if you feel like you need to put an addendum together about explaining testing performance, you may want to think about that. Um, a lot of students can show really adequately that, look, I took the SAT and ACT, and this is my GPA here at UTD, so sometimes the test may not be a, an accurate reflection of my true abilities, you know, and that's a really good argument they're able to produce and, and show for us. Um, if that's something that kind of tends to happen to you. Very common topic in a, in a testing addendum. Questions about the test? I don't know an average GRE score, that's a good question. We don't have enough, I mean, I could probably report it, but it would be such a high margin of error because we have so few applicants that have taken it. Um, it's gonna be several years. I mean, we're, we're definitely keeping track of it and doing a lot of data analysis on people we admit with GRE, um, but that's a really good question. I would have to get back to you on that and provide another response, but that's, that's a good question. Yes. Yeah, some, some feel like they may have to submit one, like, especially if they had a jump, like their test score was super low and then it jumped, they're like, oh, I gotta explain it because, you know, they're gonna think that, you know, this is wrong or something. Um, so sometimes like a, a, a big increase or decrease will cause an addendum, but yeah, usually not after two or three times. We're, it's pretty normal to see at least two scores per candidate now. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really see 
uh, a one, one timer. Uh, most people, in, in my opinion, actually like ensure when they're testing, they set aside at least two to three test dates ahead of the deadline just in case they want to retest again. And I think now there's like a cancel option, right? Where you can choose to cancel it. If you know, if you come out of there, you're like, I know I just bombed it. Like I don't even want them to count it, but. First time test taking. Okay. And it is editorially speaking, another LSAC money grab. Ah. Mm. Oof. Yeah, see, but I mean, you know, if, and here's a question from that. Do you even notice whether students have canceled or not? No, uh, I mean, we used to see all of our only reported scores, but we don't see an uh, indication of canceled, you know, this. So, yeah. Because I've had a lot of people worry, you know, are they going to see that I canceled? The answer is no. No. Other questions? Yes. I mean, technically no, but I would say we have more historical data and more obviously like understanding of the LSAT more so. I mean, the GRE is still fresh out of the gate and people are still accepting it every year. There's more law schools coming on board. Uh, I mean, the main reason I could tell you just flat out was that there was this big interest in getting students that had more of a STEM background into law schools nationally. and. They thought like getting the GRE where that would attract people to like throwing in a law school application if they didn't have to take the LSAT was like the main impetus for, for studying that. But now ETS has really kind of caught on and are really trying to service law schools and you know really work with law schools one on one and helping to validate the test more as an indicator of, of ability. So I mean, it's still kind of in the intro stages, but I would say if you have an LSAT over a GRE, I mean, I feel like most law schools will see the LSAT in a little bit of a higher, higher priority. Yeah. The way it is with the ABA right now is that else, if you ever take the LSAT, that is the score that will be reported. So you can't take the LSAT and the GRE and then say, oh, I like my GRE score better. The law schools have to report. Yeah, the ABA makes us put, take the LSAT first. So if you have a double score, Hopefully it's double GRE and not the LSAT GRE mix. Yes, question? Yeah, I mean, we, like I said, I think that's important where an addendum can come and explain that. So it's more of like, this was happening in my life or the testing conditions were not suitable for my true ability and things like that, you know, are, are pretty common or s something happened the day before the test. I mean, I would say you're more than happy to submit an addendum to explain, yeah, the increase or the, the decrease for sure. Okay, next. Record, GPA is this, uh, the other big uh, question I get. So it is more than just a number. Um, be aware that when we get a report from LSAC, it provides so much more information that y'all probably don't even, aren't even aware of. So people always ask me like, how does my application look if I'm applying against a student from other, you know, X university? Um, we, the LSAC has all this data that they provide and what they do is they send it all in a report. They, we see your gra individual grade patterns. We see the grades. Um, in their categories per semester, like in a column. Um, and we also get all this information, like how you compared against other UT Dallas students coming from the same major as yourself. So it's more against how you are um, evaluated against similar peers that also apply to law school within the same university, the same major. So we don't see or like, you know, people think that there's some uh, misconceptions of like evaluation based on on those types of factors. Um, other, other, uh, another really cool thing that people don't understand is your GPA may not be the exact same number you think it is. So you're required to submit all transcripts from, uh, you know, AP, IB, community college, dual credit, anything you've earned that was towards your bachelor's degree. You have to send it to LSAC, and they actually standardize your GPA because there's so many different scales. Like higher ed is not on a one scale nationwide. So what they do is they look at all courses and they help standardize your GPA to um, a particular score on a four point scale that gets reported to us. And that's the official GPA that's used for reporting, that's used for evaluation, for scholarship evaluation. So um, depending on other credits you may have earned or other transcripts you have out there, um, the GPA you have from the transcript at UTD may not be the only f like number that's put into the final number. 
Um, minimum to apply 2.2, and again, fluctuations could happen. We have a lot of students that, you know, started off in the wrong major, did not do well, and they, um, you know, find their fit maybe after taking an elective, or maybe while they were in their old major, they kind of found where their true passions lied, and they switched, and now they're excellent students. So any kind of fluctuations happening, both with involvement in your resume and with grades, uh, we'll probably need an addendum to explain those types of things, too. Yes, without any, well, this is the, what I'm, t the median GPA is off of this LSAC standardized GPA. So it, they account for like all the plus minuses or like 100 point scales or, you know, all the different GPAs you see out there. Um, so the GPA that you see that you, when you read it on university websites or law school websites or on 509 reports, it is that standardized scale. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I mean, again, we, we look at all sorts of experiences. So something to keep in mind is that if, you know, the law school student bodies were so homogenous, it would not, law school would not be done really well because it's so discussion based and discussing of cases that you have to have a kind of heterogeneity in the classroom to be able to have a, a, a strong discussion about, especially a lot of complex, convoluted legal topics. So. Um, you know, grad GPAs, just like this gentleman mentioned, not going to be counted in the standardized GPA, but, you know, as it could add to the diversity in the classroom. It's going to add to our community, you know, and so, um, you know, if that's what you want to write a small addendum about, great, or if you want to highlight it in another way within your resume or within mentioning it through your personal statement story, um, you know, that's, that's where I would see that could be a, a, an asset. All right. Next, letters of recommendation, two are required. If you're gonna be applying right from UTD, probably within, again, two to five years, or if not right from undergrad, you'll need at least one professor recommendation, if not both of them being from an academic source. We are an academic professional school. Um, your main focus in this process is to convince our committee that you can handle the rigor at, at the law school, because it is a step up academically. So, um, you know, for those of you who have a couple of years late, uh, later to, um, to tackle before you apply, I mean, work also on cultivating faculty relationships, um, making sure you get faculty letters um, to kind of talk about your academic skills. So this could be work ethic, leadership, your writing ability, speaking ability, how you um, apply information or concepts. Um, again, you really want this, the professor not to write what I call a do not, has never been arrested letter or is a good student letter, like just very basic, very superficial words that doesn't really get into a really good evidence of ability other than like, yeah, the student was great, you know, was always in class, participated, you know, um, so try to avoid people that may do that. You definitely want that person that's gonna advocate for you and um, write a really, really great letter uh, for you. Um, Trying to think of another tenant. Definitely, it doesn't matter about like prestige. I always have students that said, oh, you know, like my neighbor is a rep or a, a Dallas city leader or something like that. Like, what about a letter from them? And I said, again, if they're just gonna be this person's a great citizen, a great neighbor, family's great, never, you know, if that's all they're gonna say, it may not be the best use of the letter. Um, if also, if they take your resume and repeat it verbatim or in a different way, not the best use of that. We want people that are going to add more to the application and not, you know, just repeat. So if there are those types of people that are going to be, that you, you can kind of see that that's what they're going to end up doing, you may want to try to find someone else or kind of help them understand, like, they're going to see all this information, like, I, I need you to, you know, talk about this experience that, you know, I worked with your team on or, um, this project I worked with you on or this particular paper is kind of like what I want to have focus on. Um, you can also have employers, job, uh, internship supervisors, community leaders. Um, you know, you are allowed to ex do a third letter outside of the second. So I always say like, great to have someone highlight like your, who you are outside of the classroom, your personality, the way you work with people. Um, again, you can never choose your clients in the legal profession or who you work with or for. So being able to showcase that, like I can handle being around different groups of people from different backgrounds, 
uh, a plus within you know budding lawyers uh, as well as you know leadership and all those other qualities that I talked about. You ever that what's that movie called where it's the Inside Out where the different emotions are like people? So you want to think of that in the same way. Like every letter should almost be a different personification of like a different attribute of you, and only focus on that. Where all of them together really kind of culminate into like one person, right? So. If everything kind of repeats, even within the letters, not the best use of the space. Questions on that? Yes. Um, so no, what you do is, what's really cool is LSAC kind of holds them for you for up to five years. So once you, you create your LSAC account, um, a really great service they have is they hold all your letters. So especially if you know you're not gonna be applying for like maybe four to five years after um, college, Get the letter now, you know, why they know you, and they'll be able to hold it for you um, for up to five years so that you can then apply it, you know, when you're, when you're ready to apply. So that's a really good question. You can also, with LSAC service, you can also choose which letters go to which law school um, too. So, I mean, feel free to continue gathering letters, and again, you can have a slew of them at your disposal, and you can kind of pick and choose which schools see which letters depending on how you want to frame your application. Other questions? Yes. Um, I see that two letters are required. Do you have a preference for more? I mean, I'm always like, a, a third letter can always be great if it's not repetitive and it adds more. Yeah. I mean, anything that you see that you should, you can turn in, I, would, I always lean on doing it because it's just going to add more to who you are. And we're not interviewing you in person. We, are, we do have a video exercise, which is coming up next. But it's not a straight reciprocal interview where I'm getting to know you like I am now. So it's more of a, um, I think it's just you know, helpful if you, you know, show different, different sides of yourself, for sure. Yes. OK. Next, optional statements. All right. Explaining circumstances, explaining things that may have been unique um, of what's been happening, um, definitely great. We talked about common addendums with the test and the GPA, so that, that's pretty common. Um, if any of you have had any character fitness issues, which is like you have a, a record on a, in a criminal level, you do have to disclose that. Um, students all the time, I'm sure this is a common question, should I disclose or should I not? It was, I only got a warning. You know, are they going to be able to find this from the police records or whatever they? So whatever you, at least in Texas, you have to do this form called a an intention of declaration, intent of declaration to practice law. Declaration of intent to study law. Yes, declaration of intent to study law in Texas, and as soon as you submit that, and your application from admission goes to the bar, they really comb your record like backwards and forwards and find everything. So we all law schools give about a month period once you start to have a chance to amend it, right? To like add things to your application that you didn't disclose that you may want to. And every law school has the state bar that comes and visits and they kind of talk about this process in person, like what they're gonna do in your record so you're familiar and you know. But we always have students that amend their applications and add things that, you know, hot plate issues, I had a illegal animal in my dorm room, I mean, all sorts of stuff, you know, just, they want to make sure everything's covered that they may have gotten in trouble for that could be on a record somewhere that they didn't disclose, because it's worse if you don't disclose and then they find it. Even if the issue was like minuscule, it just shows a little bit of a ethical uh, issue, right, which is a crucial thing in the legal profession. So uh, if you're in doubt, disclose, but you do have to submit uh, um, statements on any character and fitness questions. Questions about that? A big thing with optional statements, we're not looking for fl like the literary uh, you know, tools that you're trying to kind of wow us with in the personal statement. This is way just the story. Just tell us the facts, what you learned from the experience, boom, that's it. You know, so not meant to be long or, or elaborative unless it's really crucial to the understanding of what happened, okay? Next, it should be the video exercise, yes. I, I wish they would call this video exercise because it's not an interview, you're not talking with us. But for those of you who pass our initial evaluation from the committee, you will get invited to join a platform called Kira Talent. Kira is a way to assess um, interpersonal skills. And the reason for this, because I've been here since the start of this kind of trend, was um, students were coming out of law school and they still were kind of lacking in a lot of interpersonal skills and communication skills. Gr looked great on paper, great with, you know, um, on that, but when they got to the employer level, the law, law firms were like, uh, not, you know, doesn't really know certain social skills as well. So um, the, the kind of move came from the career side back down. Like law schools should prepare their students and graduates to be at these levels by this point. Um, 
Hopefully that has happened already in the undergrad side, but most law schools will have this type of process where they either interview you now or they kind of get an assessment of, of extemporaneous speaking is kind of the best way to put it. So you're gonna get a randomized set of questions. Questions will be different per person, so not everyone gets the same set of questions. You can practice on this platform where you essentially have your webcam up and it, the question will be like, it'll be me on a recording being like, hey, Thanks for applying. Tell me where you like to go on vacation. And then a minute will start, and then you have 90 seconds to uh, respond once that minute is up. So the video camera goes on, it records what you say for 90 seconds, and then it sends that video clipping to the admissions office for your file. Um, and so that will happen. All the questions are fun at first, but the questions for the actual process are you know, obviously more serious of note, but you know, it could be a fun platform exercise, you know, just to kind of test the questions and how you would answer them and, you know, to test your uh, staging, making sure you're, I've seen all sorts of stuff. I've seen animals pop up. I've seen, I don't know why this, I had an applicant who's like lingerie and underwear were hanging up behind them on a, on a clothesline, people with GoPros that were talking and trying to move around at the same time or web signals go out. So, you know, there's some like undermining things that, you know, we gather about a person when we see those mistakes, like they didn't really take this seriously, maybe they're not a, a big fit for our community. So part of that, part of this process is kind of testing your prep for this and testing the staging and how, how you look and, um, you know, how you appear, how you speak. So those are kinds of things that, um, you know, are starting to kind of call, come up as important because y'all's generation has been so technology based, right? And not a lot, maybe not as much interpersonal interaction. So law schools are wanting to kind of assess those types of abilities. Questions on that? Oh yeah, there is a writing sample. Yeah, it's 15 minutes. So it's like another LSAC writing. It's, it's not as intense as LSAC writing, but there is a writing sample, again, just to a quick question. You have 15 minutes to kind of jot your answer down. Um, you just want to take, think of it like a written exercise. So kind of definitely, you know, um, increase the language, increase, you know, like don't just type it out as if you're typing um, a message on Facebook to someone or Instagram, but definitely think of it like you're uh, writing a professional email. Yeah. So while we're at it, I'm always wondering, yeah. do you look at the LSAT writing sample mm -hmm. and how do you consider it? Good question. So how do we look at the LSAT writing sample? I mean, it is part of the process. It's the same way. It's just, you know, how I guess we get more of a true idea of a student's writing ability outside of just, because personal statements, you have all the time in the world to, to make it shine, right? So, I mean, um, I guess that's kind of where these extra writing, extemporaneous writing exercises um, do is to kind of get a more of a truer on the, on the spot, on the fly idea. Um, they are read, um, so people sometimes think like, oh, I don't need to do this. I had students that have had admissions uh, decisions reneged from just like thinking it's a joke and, you know, writing all sorts of stuff in there, thinking that we're not going to see it. So it's just like, you know, like not, not good. So definitely don't do that. Good question. No, it's okay. <laughs> so this occurs, yeah, so this occurs like, this should be a good sign of like, I'm almost in, I just gotta pass this last phase kind of symbol. So you've passed like the paper evaluation, like we like what we see, we like the, yeah, so if you get the interview for this part, it's definitely um, a good sign, yeah. And I think we've bought enough licenses to cover our full applicant pool. Like we've been, in, we've been in situations where we've bought licenses that we can only cover up to a certain point of people and then the rest we just had to go on the fly, but I think we are now like making sure everyone who we're considering admitting has a chance to go through this. Question on this side? Yes. Yeah, so this platform, we, we probably prepared like 30 questions, and the system randomizes which questions you get. Um, and you also have to sign a disclosure that you are not gonna report it on Reddit or any other like third-party website, because you know we wanna be fair in this process, and it's not fair if people later than you get it, so most people are good about it, so we've had issues when we first started using this, because I think also like Northwestern, Cornell, there's other schools and other business schools that use Kira now, so it's starting to become a more common thing that you'll see in grad professional schools, just to, if they don't interview in person, they'll probably put you through something like this um, for that purpose.
All right, next slide. Get to know your pre-law advisor, right? What are your, you, you make an appointment whenever? And I'm still doing virtual appointments now, and so you can go to the website, and there's a link to make a virtual appointment with me. You can send me an email, and it says, hey, Dr. Kirby, I want to make an appointment with you, and I'll email you back, and my signature has the link. And so uh, be respectful of the students who are in the current admission cycle, because right now I'm looking at personal statements, mm -hmm. resumes, and they're getting a lot of my attention. But when the spring comes, especially, I'd love to talk to everybody. Yeah, so this is a, pr a pre pretty big part of the cycle because people are trying to meet early decision deadlines and deadlines before the holidays, so it's a big... I'm sure our pre-law advisors across the state are busy reviewing, but um, great resource. They work with us. They kind of also kind of um, come visit our campuses, and so they're, uh, again, I think, an uh, invaluable resource for you. Um, visit lsac.org. Go to law school websites. We have appointments to make on Zoom where we can, uh, you can meet with me one-on-one, -on -one and we can talk more, and you can have questions more about the application, so feel free to, to do that. Um, I also meet one-on-one -on -one with people about financial aid concerns. Uh, scholarship concerns, and so um, there's different Zoom appointments for different tenants, whether it's financial aid or admissions um, that you can make. Um, we also have virtual events as well as, uh, right now you can come and visit and take a tour of the building, um, which is great, but we used to offer like in-person classes where you can sit in on a 1L class. Um, that has not been released from like the COVID protocols yet. Um, may be in the spring, but if you're going to be maybe uh, applying next year, it may come a, come about where you can sit in on classes as a 1L next year. But we can set you up with talking with students, faculty, um, things like that if you have particular interests. Don't pay too much attention to rankings. Um, you know, it's it's an objective measure, right, by a, a, a third party. But what I wanted to say is, you know, return on investment and other attributes, what you really want to do, what programs may have particular uh, specialties, that may be more important. Um, so just make sure you understand, like, what is important to you, geographic market employability, like all those types of things should kind of come into play um, of, of your choice. All right, next slide. It should be about the money. Yes, my favorite topic. So, real quickly, personal resources. Hopefully you've taken an inventory of kind of what it is that you may want to put towards law school, but most people want to know about the scholarships. Our process is pretty unique where you have to be admitted first and then you get the scholarship application after that point. Scholarship applications go out starting January 1st. Um, anyone that's been admitted up to that point will receive it at that time. This year, it's going to be a little bit different in that we're not going to start reviewing for scholarships until mid-March, and we'll put this in the scholarship application, so we don't, um, or not, we're not going to turn around and give you a two to three week response uh, until enough people come in and then we can start um, dispersing funds. We actually also have a really robust uh, scholarship reconsideration process where you can upload other offers you've received from other law schools. Uh, you will provide a statement mostly on a financial background of yourself. You provide like how much debt you've incurred, if you're working right now, what's your salary, um, so other financial statistics, but it's meant for us to, our committee for, to reevaluate you and, and consider an increase. If we do give you an increase in that process, you have until the deadline of April 15th to say yes, but if you say yes to that increase, it is a binding agreement where you are required under the contract you signed to essentially like withdraw from all the other schools you've been admitted to. You can still remain on wait lists for schools, but you would have to withdraw. So be aware that with the money process, there are negotiations that law schools use, negotiation procedures, formal procedures, read the rules, ask me uh, about them so that you don't mess up or uh, you know get into a situation that you, you didn't intend to, because um, money is important, but you know it's just also set to protect each other because it is kind of a chess game in the middle of spring, unfortunately. As you can imagine, people are trying to balance different deadlines and trying to acquire as much money as they can from all the schools they've been admitted to. So it, it's just measures are put in place from us to just protect ourselves and protect you as, a, as an applicant. Um, we do use grants, uh, both from the state and from the law school, in our commitment. So if, say if we give you a... a you know, our average this year, 50% cut, was like 15000 uh, a year. Um, that could be made up of grants and scholarship money. So when a student gets a commitment from Texas law, it does include um, whatever you earn from grants, whatever is not 
funded from the grant side is funded from the scholarship endowment side. So uh, grants for us are not used as an addition to, they're used as part of a commitment that we promise. Uh, we have loans out there, we can talk about that later, but there's also loan forgiveness programs. We just redid our loan forgiveness program about two years ago, where if you're working a job under 60,000, you get about 100% coverage um, towards your loans. If it's between 60 and 80,000 in the public service space, we have an imputed contribution formula that we will give you a forgivable grant um, or forgivable loan that will become a grant after working six months at a time per portion of that LRAP program, so that's what we do right now to help support students going into public interest. All right, next slide. Things to consider, we do not, no longer have a Texas resident fee waiver, so everyone now has the fee to pay at 75, I think, 70 or 75, I keep forgetting. But there are LSAC fee waivers. If you get a fee waiver from LSAC to get the test covered and some of your services covered, we do accept that as an application waiver. Um, you can also apply for a need-based waiver individually through our website where you will have to disclose like financial aid packages and other things um, to gain a waiver from the admissions process. Um, there is early decision binding. Um, it's November 1, so it's like next week. So uh, be aware that if that is something you're interested in, you're pretty much saying Texas law or bust. Um, applying that early, have everything up, up to speed. The next slide will show the deadlines for that, but um, you know, it, it's a great thing that we have. If you're admitted, you're given a competitive scholarship, you're done, you can enjoy the spring, not have to worry about applications, because you are considered a, a member of our class at that point, and we just started releasing decisions already for the first cohort of early decision people. Um, but we're going through that primarily in the winter. Yeah. All right, I think this is my last slide coming up. Yes, deadlines. So if you can see there, if you're gonna be applying early decision in a cycle, which is a binding agreement, it comes with a competitive scholarship, but again, it's like a Texas law or bust type of thing. Uh, the deadline is November 1. That means you have to take the LSAT by October of that fall or earlier, and you have to register for the CAS service, which is the people that evaluate all of your credentials and you know, like your transcripts and recommendation letters, they'll keep all that for you. You have to register with them by early October. Our regular decision deadline's March 1. You can see the deadlines for the tests so that you can prep for that. I always say, like, get the deadlines and then t do your test prep schedule going backwards and treat it like a part-time job. Like, you know, you should be putting about 10 to 20 hours a week preparing for the exam, um, whether it's LSAT or GRE, before you actually take it. Uh, and then that way you have at least, you can get knock that out, work on the application. Again, that personal statement, don't start too late. That's probably the one piece that takes the most amount of time, all the drafts, all the brainstorming, writing. So make sure you also start on that pretty early in this process. All right, last, qu last slide I think is my question slide or applying. We have Twitter, email, I think, I think we have an Instagram, UTexasLaw. Um, and then I think my last slide may have my email on it. If not, I have cards here. But questions I can take about anything uh, while we wrap up. Yes. Quick about early decisions. Okay. Sure. So about how many people apply every year early decision? Sure. Is it an advantage? So question is, should I apply early decision? Is it an advantage? I would say uh, for the timing, yes. We. We don't admit a whole bunch of people from early decision. Most people that um, apply early actually get held over to the regular pool. So you wanna think of it like a bell curve. Uh, a small portion of that group will be admitted early, a small portion will be straight out denied, but the majority of applicants will be told, hey, we're gonna wait for the rest of the pool to kinda come in and then look at you against everyone else again. So, um, it is, but it is a strong statement that you're telling us, like, I would come here if admitted, um, but if you, the good thing about um, early decision is, you, again, the competitive scholarship. Bad thing is that if you get admitted early, obviously you shouldn't have this happen, but you're not gonna be allowed to do like any kind of negotiation with other law schools, because you shouldn't be applying to other law schools. So you should, be, you know, you'll be prohibited from anything um, outside of the scholarship that you're given, but you could earn scholarships from like the law school as a second and third year from organizations, journals that you're a member of. Um, but I don't consider it a disadvantage at all. Um, I think it's, a great way to tell us like, hey, I'm, I'm really interested in your school and this is where I wanna be. I wanna be part of your community. That's just my opinion about it. But I would not throw in an application without strong, you know, you have to weigh how strong your application is. And if you can't get it ready in time, um, I, don't, I don't think it's worth putting in a shoddy application to that pool. If you're, if you're 
No, that's right. Yeah, if you're held, or, uh, held over to regular, then you're not bound by any kind of like uh, admissions agreements or scholarship agreements. So everything kind of goes back to a normal, a normal state. Yes? Just, gosh, I mean, um, superlative writing, great academic ability, great letters. Um, I mean, I mean we, we just want this person here. Like, they were, they were great on their video exercise. They, yeah, so I mean, everything kind of just checks off. Uh, and we've, you know, felt like we were impressed. I think a big thing of advantage with early is this is when we're most fresh. Like, we're not putting your file through a, a, a computer or an AI thing to kind of like evaluate you. Other, if, if we cared about tests and GPAs only, like I wouldn't need to be here. I'd just sort y'all by LSAT GPA and admit the top, you know, thousand, right? And hope for a class of 200 something or 300 something. So, you know, um, make sure that you understand that. Like there is a weight to all these other factors outside of just what appears on paper um, and what appears on tests and on, on your transcript. So don't discount that at all. <laughs> Uh, do we have data to disclose? Uh, I probably could get something to you, and I could probably report it to Dr. Kirby, and she could probably send it out um, if I could f get that information of like how how many people get admitted early or not. Um, I, I always think of it like a bell curve because the number changes from year to year. So a small portion on each side, like 25%, will get admitted. 25% usually get denied, and then 50% get held over. Yeah, that's probably a good way to think of it out of any given pool. I think it's just more on you um, and how you frame it in the application. Um, my question was about grad degrees again. Uh, you know, don't, th don't think of it as, like, I gotta go to grad school because it's gonna make my law school application look better. Um, you know, hopefully that, in my opinion, I don't think that would be the right reason to go, but, um, you know, hopefully it's to further your understanding of a subject or knowledge of a subject, and maybe it's because you wanna work within, like, I don't know, I'm thinking of maybe it's like a master's of social work or it could be a master's of economics or business or in like Latin American studies because you really have an interest in that area of the world or an interest in working with those populations that are underserved and you're just showing that like I'm wanting seeing, I want to see these things from a different side of a different academic perspective or a different academic lens, you know, which is I think a big part of what makes law school unique is we have so many different centers that focus on issues, but they bring in other experts from other fields, other graduate students. So our students work in a lot of these policy centers that are, some of them are hosted at the law school, but they're, they under, I think we all understand that some of these issues that are, that are kind of problems of today are not cut and dry, they're, they're very convoluted and it takes seeing things from different disciplines in different subject lenses to kind of like come up with a solution besides just a legal lens. So I mean, I think that's where a grad degree could potentially kind of help in an application. Um, but if you're thinking law school versus grad school, I mean, try both out. You're not gonna be, again, we're not going anywhere. Average age is 24. We have several, plenty of students that, are, that again, most of our students come in two years from graduation to five years out. We do have an OWLS group, older, wiser law students, so people that are in their 30s, 40s plus that come in, you know, to law school and second career people. So it's it's definitely, you know, um, out there whenever you're ready. Well, I want to thank you all so much for being such an attentive audience. If you came in late, feel, please feel free to sign in. I have books, cards. Come down to Austin and visit us. Um, we would love to host you. Uh, I'm happy to keep talking to you all individually. I'm pretty much this is my only event that I'm heading meeting up with a uh, buddy of mine for lunch and I'm heading back to Austin this afternoon. But uh, I hope you found this worthwhile and I will leave it to the organization to close out y'all's program. Thank you so much, Hope and Borns. Um, thank you once again for Mr. Mia for taking this time out of his day to come and we just have a sign in form and there's also one up here. So if y'all would be able to fill it out. But thank you all once again. <laughs>